All right. Praise the Lord. Well, you know, praise God. I uh, I remember one time I went to it. There was one year whenever I, I got a license with a particular denomination. And, I, man, I just felt this burning in my heart that I wanted to go preach at every church. Well, one of the things that this denomination would do was they'd give you like a little book with all the pastor's names and numbers in there. And I was thinking, boy, they made a mistake giving me that. And I'm telling you, man, I called almost every pastor in that book. It didn't matter what part of Louisiana. I mean, if I if I already knew you, I might not have called you. But, but look, look and so I called every one of them, dude. And I can't tell you how many of them rejected me, but there was about 12 pastors that let me come preach in their church that year. And there was this one old boy, and I'm not going to say what city he was in, but after we, after I preached, we went and we, we sat down to go eat, and uh, you know, I was kind of like trying to fill him out a little bit, and he said, what? Well, he said, man, you don't fit in nobody's mold. I said, well, what you talking about, man? He said, well, you, you teach like a Baptist, but you preach like a Pentecostal, and you don't fit in nobody's mold. I said, fit in somebody's mold? Really, dude? I'm out here trying to break molds. I don't want to fit in anybody's mold. The only reason I bring that up is, is that if you're visiting for the first time or you haven't been in a while, my message contains some information in it this morning that I wouldn't say is typically considered conventional for a Sunday morning. As a matter of fact, it's there's some concepts in here that they don't even teach us in Bible college. As a matter of fact, in the Bible college I went to, I don't even think that they believe that this is the right interpretation. But what I, And so, you know, a lot of times in, in churches nowadays, they kind of have this idea in their mind of what a Sunday morning message is supposed to be. And you kind of stay within the constructs Amen. of what that idea should be. But I've never wanted to fit in anybody's mind. I kind of just really want to let the Lord lead me and tell me what it is that he desires for me to say. So I'm, I am going to let you know up front that there is some information in here. But I'm going I'm to give you some scripture. Now, I'm not going to break the concept down in great detail. I've done that before on Wednesday nights and even sometimes on Sundays and I've done special services to, to do that because there's a plethora of information that talks about this thought process and I can prove it even better whenever I start using New Testament scriptures. But nevertheless, I just want you to know ahead of time, I do believe that it's relevant for this message. And this is what the Lord put on my heart. You know, I, I guess you would say that if I was going to title it, I put, what power are you running? I, I guess really I should have asked the question, what current are you on? The only, what I say about that is, is that I remember when we moved to Singapore when I was about nine years old, we couldn't bring any of our electronic devices with us back in the day. I mean, you weren't going to carry that on a, on a plane anyway. The toasters back in those days were a lot bigger, but you couldn't plug it in anyway. They had a completely different currency, right? And so... To this morning, that's the question. What power are you running? Can you put Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 up there for me? Just a short scripture that I want to read to you. It says uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Again, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So what power are you running? What Currency are you connected to? Are you connected to the currency that they had in the States? Are you connected to the currency that they had in Singapore? No, that's not what I'm asking. Are you connected to the currency that man tries to draw his power from when he looks at things that are placed upon the earth? Or are you connected to the currency that empowers mankind upon the earth that you receive from God? Because that's the emphasis of this scripture. It's about the believer being strong in the battle. I'm, I'm talking to you about a battle this morning. About the believer being strong in the battle through the power of God's might. You know, this is one of the hardest things for believers to really transition into. To learn how to relinquish control of their own power. To learn how to relinquish their own wisdom, their own intellect, and their own way of fixing their situations and circumstances that they find themselves in the midst of. If you, you know... I, I oftentimes, sometimes I'll try to make it real. I don't really always like doing that. But I mean, I, one of the things that I use a lot, and just bear with me, you've heard me say it so many times, I have financial woe. And so I try to fix my situation or circumstance by going get a payday loan. You just really made a bad mistake. God never told you to do that. Don't tell me that. The, I don't believe that. I mean, I don't believe that the Lord told you to do that. I mean, not with the kind of usury that they're going to charge you. It's not, it's not the Lord's will. 
now if we've all maybe no we haven't all done it but you get the point that's just one example of you know i don't know relationship situations or i remember one time there was a pastor and he's like man i bought this brand new car for her but immediately when i was signing the papers i felt like this heaviness in my heart what do you think i'm like well i think the holy spirit was trying to tell you that you didn't need to buy that brand new car and it's not it's not me to determine when you should buy a car, whether it should be a brand new car or a used car. You and the Lord know about your finances better than I do. But the point is, is that the Lord doesn't want you outstepping. I'm trying to use examples of situations where we try with our own intellect and in our own strength to, to navigate a circumstance, to correct something or fix something instead of truly waiting and trusting on the Lord to have his way. And many times we like to believe that we are waiting on the Lord. And I'm not saying that we never wait on the Lord. But what I'm trying to get at is, is that we have a tendency to get impatient. We have a tendency to get ahead of the Lord, right? That's why they put a bit in a bridle in a horse's mouth to hold him back. Because sometimes he just doesn't want to do it the way that his master wants him to do it. Instead, he wants to take off and he wants to, to show that he has his own power and his own strength. I was sharing with a girl just yesterday, I believe it was. And I was sharing this very thing with her. And I said, you know, the reality is is that many times we find ourselves in situations and circumstances and we're trying to fix and remedy our own problems but God is not going to honor that Listen, you might think you're cruising along and you got everything going in the right direction, but I'm telling you right now, if you get ahead of the Lord and you do things in your own time and you're going to run up against some serious speed That's bumps right. and you're going to run right. up against some serious trial and tribulation. And look, you better remember the song whenever you find yourself in that circumstance. He is good, good. Oh. Even though you got bad circumstances going on in your life, the Lord's still good. Amen? Come on, somebody. The, the earth is messed up. People on it are messed up. But God is still right. good. Praise Hallelujah. God. Listen. Right. Sometimes you talk to people out there that, and they're talking about, yeah, but Christians don't do what they're supposed to do. Look. That don't mean Jesus isn't right. Amen. Come on, somebody. The preacher don't get it right all the time. You know you don't get it right all the time. Right? You know, I used to say this a lot, and I hadn't said it too much here lately, but I just, you know, sometimes you see some new faces. I just want to get something out in the open real quick. If you have never been hurt by a Christian before, brace yourself. Because <laughs> it's going to happen. I hate to say it, but I think the devil uses Christians more often than what he, than what he uses uh, folks in the world. Anyway, I don't know why I said that, but I did. I hope somebody in this church doesn't hurt you, but, but brace yourself. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to do something that's going to irritate you. You know, and I will say that this one, that was one thing that that, that old pastor that I used to say, Brad Bullock, I, I don't mind saying his name. I love that dude, man. Some he has some wisdom beyond his years, man. And he used to say, you know, you can't even get along with yourself, but, but we're the family of God. And had, did you look at the last time that you looked at your own family and how that situation was working out? I mean, now, if Brad was watching the video, he would actually agree that mo most times we don't want to admit how dysfunctional our real family is, right? <laughs> and how oftentimes we don't get along with one another. Well, guess what? That's going to happen in the family of God also. This has nothing to do with my message. Well, it does in the sense that we go through circumstances and trials in life and we're in the midst of a battle. And in the battle, we got to remind ourselves whose might, yes. whose power are we operating in? You know, the word for power here is different than what most Bible students are used to. If, you're, if you've studied the Bible, when you hear the word power, oftentimes, automatically in your mind, you may think of the word dunamis. In the Greek, that's where we get the word dynamite. It describes a power. You know, I just imagine the explosion of dynamite. Anything that stands in the way of God, it's like the breath of God, like an explosion. God's just going to move it out of his way. There's nothing, amen, that can stop the power of God. Whatever obstacle you might find in your life, if it's still there, guess what? It's because God is allowing that obstacle to continue to be there. And that, but when he's ready to move it, amen, he will be able to move it. I can assure you of that. But this word is different. This word, I'm going to actually use the board today. This word is crater. Okay, that's how you would say it in the Greek. If you were going to write it out, I'm not going to write it in the Greek. 
just because that's just kind of weird because it just seems like you're trying to act, act like you're smart or something. But, but, the, but the word crowder there, it describes a power and a strength that's connected to dominion. And I want you to understand something. that When we're talking about dominion, we're talking about the fact that God has dominion over this earth. Amen. I'm probably getting ahead of myself in my notes, but the God that you serve scattered stars in the sky and breathed life into a lump of clay. I just like saying that. It does something in my spirit when I think about that. He calls an inanimate object to gain life. You might not believe that. Some people in here may not believe that. The scientists might try to convince your children when they go to secular college that it's not true. But I'm here to tell you, I believe what the Word of God says. And what I'm here to tell you is this, is that God has the kind of strength that He is in dominion over the entirety of this universe. He spoke it into existence with His Word. Amen? Now, I want you to know that this word is specifically being contrasted in this next verse. If you could put Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 12 up there. Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we wrestle. See, this is why you got to be strong in the power of his might. Amen. Amen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers. That word rulers right there is, the, is this word underneath. Cosmocrator. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. You see, the reason why this message is so important on the first level is because you need to know that you are in a spiritual battle, yes. not a physical battle. What, what I want you to know is this, is that, yes, you face obstacles in the physical every day that you navigate this journey called Christianity. But the physical obstacles you face are being driven by spiritual forces. Yes. In other words, the friend that talks and gossips behind your back affects you, affects you physically in the sense that it may affect you emotionally, it might affect you mentally, it might affect you socially, right? But they are being affected by spirits in order to do it. So you look at this, you feel so hurt from this person that has done this to you. But the reality of it is, is that they were just a vessel used by spirits of darkness in order to try to cause conflict and harm in your life. I believe that. We're about to get even deeper. If being spiritual makes you get the eebie-jeebies, then you're about to get the eebie-jeebies up in this place. Because I believe in the spiritual realm. I believe that we're not warring against flesh, but instead against principles. Principalities and powers against wickedness and high places against against these world rulers. And I'm about to talk to you a little bit more about that. But it's not just the friend that gossips behind your back, the lust that you're being tempted by. Yes, the, the truth is, is that the person that you are attracted to might be attractive. Sometimes. I mean, no, that's the crazy thing about lust. <laughs> The crazy thing about lust is, is that sometimes you're being driven towards something that ain't even really very appetizing. But nevertheless, even though in certain situations it might be a deal where the, the person that you're being uh, attracted to or drawn towards is, is attractive, but still the issue is that, you're, that the, the problem is that demon spirits are behind it. Demon spirits of lust are behind drawing people in directions that they're not supposed to go. That's what I'm talking about whenever people are going in directions that they're not supposed to go. Amen. Right? Well, how do you know if I'm going in the direct? The Word of God will tell you. Amen. The Word of God will always be faithful to you and tell you if you're going in a direction, whether you're supposed to be going in that direction or not. If you don't have the Word of God to lead and guide you and be the compass, then you're reduced to like I've taught y'all before about that song where that old girl was the singer and the name of the song was Let Your Heart Be the Compass. It was, a, it was a number one for a little while back. But, you know, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Because, see, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. He didn't say the heart of the worldly man was deceitfully wicked. He said the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. He talks about in the book of Romans chapter 3 that all have are undone. That all of our mouths and all of our throats speak. There's poison in our, and like the poison of asps is in our mouth. None have done good. Not the Jew, not the Gentile. Somebody help me. We were born of Adam and we were born in sin. All oh, the people don't like to hear about sin anymore. But listen, I'm telling you, we're all in the same boat. Amen. I told this girl just yesterday. I'm like, look, 
don't get all weirded out. You know, if people are going to talk about sin, we were all born of Adam. All born in sin. That's why Jesus had to die. Amen. And that's the problem. If you haven't received Jesus, you're still guilty in your sin. Amen. You sit there and judge and look at everybody else, but some people are, are forgiven because they're under the blood of Jesus. Amen. Then give you a, a license to do whatever you want. Amen. All right. Uh, the, the other thing I put on here, I put the person at work that you want to clip on the jaw. You know what I'm talking about? Just a little, a little quick one. <laughs> because he tried to make you look bad to the boss. You ever had people, boy, I tell you, dude, I worked with a guy like that. I'm not going to tell the whole story. We were in Venezuela. Oh, man, look, I cannot stand. There's nothing that I hate worse than a person. Or frustrates me worse than a person who tries to make themselves look good at someone else's expense by making someone else look bad. Dude, I got a problem with that. But anyway, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It may not be that particular situation, but some situation in the workplace where this person is just getting under your skin. And what you would like to do if you were going to flesh out on them is you'd like to just basically what I said, you'd like to clip them in the jaw. <laughs> See, it's a physical person, it's a physical circumstance, but he's, she's driven by darkness and darkness is using it to frustrate you so that you will respond the way that they want you to. See, Jesus would respond in a particular fashion, but flesh responds in a completely different fashion. And then we try to justify our actions when we do it not, not like Jesus. Well, I'm not Jesus. No, no, that ain't working no more, bro. That ain't working no more. You're not Jesus. Because, see, Jesus died on the cross and he paid a high price to allow grace to flow into your life to give you the strength that you need in order to walk properly before the Lord. He never asked you to do it on your own. He never asked you like my old, my old daddy used to tell me, boy, pull your yourself up by the bootstrap. Huck her down and get her done. No, the Lord never asked you to just pull yourself up by... Yes, yeah, sometimes... You have to come to the realization that there's things going on in your life. Now, I've always fell to this. I've always fallen into anger or frustration whenever this particular situation happens. Well, sooner or later, you do have to respond different. You got to want to respond different. Is somebody with me here? Yes. Lord, help me to respond different the next time that situation takes place on the front end. You know, I don't know about you, but you might get tired of having to humble yourself after the fact. I mean, if you really care about the Lord. I realize sometimes, you know, some people have told me, dude, you say sorry too much. And I get it because it's kind of like, okay, so you're sorry for the 150th time, but yet you keep doing the same thing. Come on, dude, your words are getting old. I, I get it. But, but, but at the same time, some people will never say they're sorry. They'll never admit that they did something wrong. Just so full of pride, so full of selfishness, they will never humble themselves and lower themselves. To, to, but, that, but that ain't Jesus. That's right. That's not Jesus. So if you think that you're looking like Jesus and that's how you're acting, that's not the Lord. Amen? Is it okay if I just speak real this morning? Amen. 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 You know that word, um, these are just some simple examples in our personal life. But listen, I need to know you, that, that this situation that we're talking about, about that we're not warring against or wrestling against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and world rulers. And, you know, that this is affecting the entirety of the world. This wrestling match that we're talking about is on a microcosmic level in your individual lives, but it's on a macrocosmic level in the world that we're living in. Did, did, did you know that the devil has a plan? See, some people, some people don't want to even talk about the devil in churches. And I'm here to tell you, there's a, this book that we read has a whole lot of information about the devil. And listen, I know that we're not talking about a physical fight this morning, but people that are in the military, they study their enemy because they want to understand. They don't want to get blindsided. They don't want to get clipped on the jaw whenever they're not looking and they're not ready for it because they don't want to take a hit like that. And so the reality is, is that sometimes we need to learn these things. We need to be aware of what the enemy's doing. Listen, that word wrestling is, you'd say it, palais. And, it, and it's a contest between two. Now, this is the physical idea where the word came from in the Greek, and now it's being used in a Christian sense. The Apostle Paul is using it. There are two are in a contest, and, and, and they're both endeavoring to throw the other one. But the victor in this type of wrestling match was decided whenever he would hold his opponent down with his, with his hand upon his neck. Finally got him to the place of submission where he had his hand on his neck and he, and he couldn't move anymore. And then finally, he was named the victor. Look, this is what they want to do to our individual lives. Who's they? These 
principalities and powers and spiritual darkness and all of these things that I'm talking about. This is what they want to do in our lives, but they also want to do this in in regarding the plan of God. I need you to I need you to understand that that the enemy wants to destroy the plan of God. See, the Lord told me a long time ago, I need you to start broadening your message. I need you to not, I want you to be able to connect to people in their individual lives. I want them to see the individual lives that they're living and the things that they're dealing with and the circumstances and let them know that I want to be there to heal those circumstances. But I also want my people to know that there's something bigger going on out here. I need my people to, sh to be shaken and to be awakened to the fact that there's something bigger going on here. I have a plan and ultimately I need souls saved. And listen, thank right. you, Lord. Thank right. you, Jesus. It's not, I make this comment all the time, that it's, it can't just be the preacher's job. I'm not buying that. That's not what the Word of God teaches. It's not just the preacher's job to do the witnessing. It's not just the preacher's job to live Jesus in a real world. Hallelujah. If that makes you uncomfortable, then you showed up to the wrong church because the, the true church has always their lives individually and corporately have been surrounded by Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Not a fellowship group where everybody likes to shoot guns. This doesn't have anything to do with my message, but I'm just trying to say that's what the modern church looks like. Oh, let's all. And I don't have a problem with people shooting guns. That's not the issue. You understand what I'm saying? I don't have a problem if you like to have friends that shoot guns. It's not about a fellowship group that gets together and goes on a jogging. I, I, I love to jog. It's not about a fellowship gathering that likes to get together and bake cupcakes. I don't have a problem with people baking cupcakes. Just don't bring them to me because I don't want to be tempted. <laughs> but what I will tell you is this. But instead, when you read the book of Acts, see, these are some of the new ways of philosophy of how to do church in the modern era that we're going to bring the ways of the world into the church and we're going to... Uh, touch people's felt needs and we're going to give them a feeling of social community but the problem is is that social community in the early church surrounded Jesus not shooting guns not jogging not you know you understand what I'm getting at I, I mean I, I hope that that makes sense and so the question is what are we doing because I was just talking to this girl I'm really off course here but just barely <laughs> So I'm this girl that I've been witnessing to for several years at work and now all of a sudden she goes to a, a church where they preach the gospel she was very religious. Before. We'll just leave it at that. And she said, and I, for, I don't know why, we were in the kitchen and it just came up. This happened like Thursday or Friday. I asked her if she, had, if she runs anymore or whatever. I said, you, ain't, you hadn't joined any of them running groups in the church, have you? Because I, I know she did. And, and so all of a sudden she said, that's so weird you said that. And so, yeah, that's sure enough. And when I explained a little bit to her, she said, you know, I thought that was kind of strange. Because they said that, you know, that this was a church group and it was about running and people that like to run. And she said, we went out there and they prayed this little short prayer. And then the next thing you know, all we're doing is running. Is it wrong to get together with Christians and run? No, that's not the point that I'm trying to make. But whenever churches are focused on trying to meet people's felt needs, instead of trying to teach the body of Christ that our common union, I'm going to go ahead and write that on the board for you. Whenever we look at the word communion, it's a compound word, right? Common union. We have a common union with one another. And you know what that common union is? It's the, it's the blood of Jesus. Amen. It's the body of Christ. It's the fact that man was born a sinner and needed a savior. And that the father loved this creation enough that he bankrupt heaven with his only begotten son. And that Amen. Jesus would take your sin, my sin, upon his sinlessness and his righteousness. And he would be the sin bearer for you and I. And he would pay the penalty because the wages of sin is death. And he would die. The, the, he would be displayed like the song said on a criminal's cross and he'd breathe out his last breath and he'd say it is finished and he would pay the penalty for sin so much so that Matthew 27 51 says that the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom signifying now that the way into the entry to the presence of God had been made available yes. for all oh man that's a good word we have a common union it's not the jogging class this has, I, don't, I don't know why we're here but we're here it's not the jogging 
fellowship. It's not the pistol shooting fellowship. It's, it's Jesus dying on the cross. And if you're not getting involved in that, and you're not excited about the fact that God, once again, bankrupt in heaven of its most prized possession, all for you, all to remedy the problem of this world, then you're getting connected to the wrong thing. And you need to get connected to the right thing. And in a way, I guess it is part of the message. What power source are you connected to? What currency are you running on? Because listen to me, you're in a spiritual battle. You see the chaos that's going on in the life. You see the things that you're experiencing. You are in a spiritual battle. And you better learn how to plug into the right power source. You better learn how to submit and to allow yourself to trust and to keep faith in what the Lord has provided for you at Calvary. To, to give you the state of righteousness so that you can stand before the Lord and receive the grace that you need from the Holy Spirit in order, in order to walk in the power of of the Lord. Listen, Cosmo Crater, this is being contrasted. Crater, the dominion of the God that we serve, that scattered the stars in the sky and breathed lump life into a lump of clay, being contrasted against world rulers. Listen, I, I don't want to read my notes. I want to just tell you the story. Do you remember the story of Daniel? Do you remember the story when Daniel started to pray to the Lord? And Gabriel shows up to him and says, hey, look, we heard your prayer when you first started praying. The response was delayed because the prince of Persia prevented us from coming to you. Do you propose that that's a prince of Persia like the Shah of Iran? I don't know. Yo, he wasn't. Y'all don't probably remember who the Shah of Iran was. I'm old. Uh, or Ayatollah Khomeini or some Persia is modern day Iran. And do you propose that it's the guy that's over there over Iran? No, that's not what they were talking about. How is some class? with a turban on his head going to stop the angel Gabriel. No, that's not what we're dealing with. We're talking about a fallen angel that has been given governing power over at that time the nation of Persia and was preventing the prayers of Daniel from coming back and Gabriel had to wait on help from the archangel Michael and when they overcame this powerful fallen angel he said, oh by the way, we took care of him but we're about to go take care of the prince of Greece next. Fallen angels. Listen, that's a biblical text that proves to us that there's a hierarchy of cosmocraters. There's a hierarchy of spiritual wickedness that you and I are dealing with. And we're seeing it manifest in our physical lives. So you must be strong in the power of His dominion. Because sometimes it may not seem like it in your personal life, but I'm here to tell you, no matter how powerful the forces of evil are operating, they are not as powerful as the one who created this earth. We need your power, Lord. We need to learn how to walk in your power. We need to learn how to submit to your will, Lord. Ephesians 6, 12, again, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'm still in my introduction here. Bear with me. As part of my introduction, I want to explain a little more about this wrestling match that you're in. This is where we're getting unconventional right here. You ready? Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. They don't teach this in Bible college. It's too scary for them. They don't want to have to explain it. It's a cry and shame, though, whenever your family member grows up and marries a Jehovah's Witness, and the Jehovah's Witness knows it, and the family member doesn't know it because they were never taught in the church. And then that just emboldens the position of the Jehovah's Witnesses because whenever they call up Uncle Matt, and yeah, he said it, when they call up Uncle Matt and he says, that's not true, right? Sorry, dude, it is true, but nobody took the time to teach you in the, in the church because they were worried that it wasn't a conventional Sunday morning message. And it came to pass when men began to multiply, we're talking pre-flood here, on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, there's one interpretation that would claim that this is actually the offspring of Cain when we're talking about the sons of God, and that they cohabited or intermarried with or commingled with the daughters of, of um, Seth, 
which was the righteous line. And so now we're going to see some type of an offspring that takes place. But I'm here to tell you that just a cursory review of the scriptures blows that out the water. And that's like, I really was offended. When are, you, are you even serious that you're going to try to throw that at me? And, and, you, and I'm supposed to be okay with that. No. Look at Job chapter 1 verse 6. Sons of God. The same terminology used again. And in the Hebrew it bears it out. The word is ben Elohim. Which means sons of God. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. There you go. There's another situation right there. And so what do you think? Satan's carrying some human beings up there to, to, to go speak to the Lord. To give an account for what it is that he's doing. I just used that text to show you. Now this is the same thing. These are fallen angels. That's what these sons of God are. These are fallen angels that are somehow connecting themselves with the daughters of men. Hold on. Let's keep going. Uh, let, let's look at... Uh, they're producing an offspring. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. There were giants, the word in the Hebrew is Nephilim, in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Now listen, I want us to just take a little bit of time with this, all right? Just a little bit of time with, with this. I want you to understand what's going on here. What the Bible is clearly teaching. Listen, there is so much extra biblical evidence that regards this. I'm not even trying to go to extra biblical evidence. I don't need to. I got so much evidence in the Bible. But I'm here to tell you there's a whole alternate history of what. Listen, there is documentation, archaeological finds that predate the book of Genesis that tell a similar story. It causes confusion whenever our children end up going to secular college because they weren't prepared to understand the concept of oral tradition. And that even though one archaeological find might predate the book of Genesis, it doesn't. all that means is that the story that was being told by oral tradition wasn't written down by God, God's version of the story till we got to Moses and he began to pin the book of Genesis. But all of that information could have also, not only that, not could have, but was also being disseminated through nations that had as their spiritual leader, angelic leader, like the fallen angel of Persia, like the fallen angel of Greece. I'm not, I didn't plan on getting this deep into this, but let me just say this. You turn the page after the Tower of Babel and you turn the page and what do you find in chapter, from chapter 11 to chapter 12? You see in, ta chapter, uh, in the Tower of Babel, God confuses the languages to cause the people groups to begin to spread across the land. And now nations are and the tongues are dividing them according to the descendants of Noah. But when you turn the page to chapter 12, what do you get? The story of Abraham. Why? Because God's going to create a nation for himself. And that nation has its own angel and his name is the archangel Michael and he's a good angel and guess what God communicates to the world through his people through his people Israel through his people Christian as he gives them his very word and that's why we got to hold on to the purity of the word of God as much as we can to understand it in its pure form to preach it in its pure form and to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in our hearts so that we can see the word of the living God God has a witness on the land. It's through his word. He's disseminating his truth and he wants people. He wants you. He wants me to know his truth. He yearns that we would desire his truth. He yearns that we would be hungry and thirst after his righteousness and to know his will and to know his word. Amen. Not just the preacher. No. Amen. He wants you to be hungry. He wants us all to be hungry. He wants us to be so hungry that when it flows out of us, it's contagious and people want to have some of what we have. Hallelujah. How did it happen? I don't know. I'm not trying to get all weird on you. I just don't know all the answers, but I know what the Word of God says. I do know this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. It's actually, maybe it's verse 2. Oh, I definitely think it must be. Yeah, there we go. See, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Boy, I tell you, when there's a block on your eyes because nobody's willing to break out of the mold, then you just stay blocked up and you can't see nothing. 
Most of us that have been in church for any length of time have heard this passage preached. And what we've been told was that, listen, what the, what the author of Hebrews is talking about is, is that you need to be attention, pay attention and to treat others, strangers with the love of the Lord, because unknowingly some have entertained the angels of God unaware. Have you ever heard that? Have you never heard stories before? You might have thought it was crazy, but I don't believe it's crazy. I think it happened to me one time where some person comes up to you and talks and, you know, this some kind of weird moment happens. And then all of a sudden you turn and that person is not even I'm telling you something like that happened to me before. But what I want you to know is this, is that I never was able to see until the Lord opened my eyes that if good angels can do it, who's to say that bad angels can't do it? Oh, I never would have attributed that. Well, that's because you've been naive. That's because you've been naive and you've been sold a bill of goods. Listen to me. If angels, angels are spiritual beings without physical bodies and they can transcend the here and now, they can move, I like to call it, from the third to the fourth dimension, whatever that means. Where the atoms float and are held together by the word of the living God. So, but what I want you to see is this, is that somehow this union, unholy union took place and there was a production of a mixed breed on the earth. And they weren't human and they weren't angel, they were Nephilim. We don't really have too much information on pre-flood world, but what the Bible tells us is that the world was so corrupt that there was only one man that God found, and it says he was perfect in all his generations. Amen. Now, if you think that means he was just perfect in his behavior, there was only one man that ever walked the earth that was perfect in his behavior. Amen. His name was Jesus. Really, when you look at it, that one, one of the words describing it is his posterity and describes his seed. Many, many commentators would tell you that this is specifically talking about his DNA, if you will. There wasn't this mix. There was so much of this stuff going on pre-flood. So, like, we don't even have time to get into all of the things that I've learned. I wouldn't even want to bore you with all those details. But I do want to make a point. Why in the world would they do this even to begin with? Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Why would the forces of evil try to even do something like this? Because, listen, Satan doesn't forget anything that God says. You might forget something God says, but Satan doesn't forget a word God says. And he's always repackaging it, and he's always wanting to turn it into a lie and he's always trying to destroy God's word so that they can destroy God's plan Genesis 3 15 I will put enmity he's telling the serpent this God is preaching to the serpent in the garden after the fall of Adam and Eve and I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed and it shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel I'm sorry I didn't even really I didn't even really want to. Can you go back to verse 14 right here? I'm sorry, go to, go, go to verse 16. Well, no, look, what the main point I wanted to show you right here more than anything, I'm not trying to talk about who the seed of the devil is and all that. I ain't wanting to get into all that. But what I want you to see is this. The seed of the woman is going to bruise and in the Hebrew crush, destroy your head. I've talked about this many a time, but you know, one thing about a snake, when you destroy its head, it loses its authority. Throughout the Old Testament, the, the head represents authority and power. What God is saying right here is the way that the power of the serpent would be destroyed is that his head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. Scholars call this the proto-evangelium. Proto means first, evangelium means preaching of the gospel. The first time the gospel was preached, it was preached by God. And who was it preached to? It was preached to the serpent. And what was he told? There's going to be a seed of a woman that's going to crush your head. So the first step in this is to try to destroy the seed of the woman. To get it to the place where it's not really a pure seed of a woman anymore, but instead it's some admixture. Because listen to me, God didn't sin. Angels sin. But that's not who's God, who God's redeeming. And an angel can't die for a man. That's why the theology that Jesus was a reinvention of the archangel Michael don't flow. That's another story for another time. Man sinned against God. Man was created without sin in the image and likeness of God. When man sinned, he took upon the corruption of sin and he no longer was in the image of what God had made him to be. The wages of sin is death. Therefore, a righteous man 
like man was originally created, had to die. God can't die. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Jesus' ministry on earth was to be the, the, the second Adam, to make right what the first Adam made wrong. Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of the seed of the woman. Satan knew that there would be a seed of a woman that would come. And then what his first attempt is to bring destruction to all of what God's plan would be. Now, look, let's go back to these Nephilim. I just want to mention this a little bit. We're kind of getting off of the more technical stuff and we're moving into something that's just a little bit more let's hopefully preachy. These offspring, as the word of God said right there, they were men of renown. They were mighty men. The idea, if you look it up in the original language, was that they were famous. I mean, you can do whatever you want with this, and you might even start doing some of your own research. But I'm telling you right now, if you can only... The Bible is very clear. I don't have to go to extra biblical search, uh, you know, text in order to make this point. The Bible talks about these giants over and over and over. The book of Joshua is full of it. The book of Deuteronomy is full of it. The, the book of Genesis says that they were here. You don't have to buy into it if you don't want to. You might want to just push it away because it seems sci-fi to you. But I'm here to tell you that there was a time frame of Upon this earth when this was well known and it was common knowledge. That's right. And the people knew what they were talking about. It wasn't an issue for the New Testament readers close to the Apostle Paul to have a problem with this because they were familiar with it. I mean, one biblical example is King Og of Bashan, and he was a he was a Nephilim. He had this he had this big old, I think that's where the concept of the king the king size bed came from. He had this 13 cubit long iron bed that he slept in. But, but, the, but the Bible talks on and on about these, these giants. And they were famous. They were, they, when you look at the word renowned, it means to be famous. Can you imagine? You ever watch that show? I mean, it was pretty violent. It was called 300. You ever saw that? You ever, you ever, you ever remember the king of Persia in that thing? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember, do you remember what, what was the story? He was like seven, like probably eight foot tall or taller, nine foot tall. I mean, he was real wicked looking. He, that was a depiction. Hollywood knows this stuff, dude. I don't want to get into, to, what's his face? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Star Wars guy. Spielberg. No, Star Wars dude. Jones. George Lucas? Lucas. Yeah. The whole concept behind Darth Vader and all that stuff and the Force and all that stuff is all behind this. It all comes, I don't have time to get into it. All right? But listen, I just want you to imagine a world where these men, pre-flood definitely, but also post-flood, this happened before and after the flood, were like kings on the earth. I mean, sharing their wickedness with the human race, attempting to destroy God's plan. Now, I brought you kind of to all of that because this was a new concept for me several years ago because I never really understood where demon spirits came from. Like, in other words, what I'm trying to say is, is that fallen angels are fallen angels. Fallen angels don't have physical bodies, and I'm not saying that they never tried to possess a person because Judas was possessed by Satan and says Antichrist will be possessed by Satan. But demon spirits are clearly, there's two different words in the Greek language. And whenever Jesus cast those devils out of, of that man, what they do? They begged permission to go into the swine. Demon spirits are different than fallen angels because they're looking for a body to inhabit. They used to be in a body, that's why. It is my contention that that's where demon spirits come from. When these Nephilim giants were killed in Old Testament times and their spirits were released, these spirits were not human. These spirits were not angelic. They were a mixture of the two. And now they have been released upon the earth and forms of darkness. Why does God allow it? The same reason he allows sin to continue on until the finality of the end. To give a, Because listen, the children of Israel fought a physical enemy and some of them were Nephilim and giants and, and, and the enemies of God. And you and I now are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and all that spiritual wickedness. You need to be able to put a face to your chaos. Because what you need to, what you and I need to understand and to know is this, is that the God that we serve, he is the God that has dominion. Yes. He is the crater power over the cosmocrat. Yes. 
He did the, this cosmocratic just thinks he's running the world. He's on borrowed time. Mm -hmm. Amen. This brings me to my story of David and Goliath. Don't y'all like that story? I got six minutes if y'all are nice to preach David. <laughs> David is a type of the believer who is being strong in the power of God's might. That's what he is in this story. That's what I'm preaching him as. He is a type of the believer that wants to be strong in the power of God's might. And Goliath is a type of the forces of darkness that we will encounter in our lives on our journey. Listen to me. It works perfect for what I'm preaching this morning because Goliath would have been one of them things. You might not have ever saw that before, but I'm here to tell you he was nine foot something. He was one of them things. When he died, look, when young David cut his head off, his spirit was released. And for all I know, that stinking spirit of Goliath is still running around this world somewhere trying to wreak havoc on somebody. Amen. Point number one in my message this morning is repeated failure results in complacency. I need you to know that this morning, Christian. Repeated failure results in complacency. Now, this goes for all of us. So if you're over there thinking, why is he preaching against me this morning? How does he know that I'm having repeated? No, I'm not. I just know how Christians live. Because why? Because I'm a Christian. I know what happens in Christian lives. I know that Christians fail. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Normal Christianity is not for us to live in failure. Rather, normal Christianity is for us to live in victory. Because Jesus paid a high price for you and I to have victory. Amen. And it's time for you and I to start by the grace of God and faith in Christ to start accessing God's grace and power. I want to remind you a little bit of the story. Israel is encamped in a place called Succoth Damon. There's a valley called Elah that separates the Philistine garrison from the Israelites. This valley of Elah, at the bottom of this valley, is a brook called Kidron. Every day, I'm not going to read the story, I'm just going to tell you the story. Every day, the same thing is happening. Some of you heard me preach this a million times, but guess what? It's the word of the living God, hallelujah, and it's alive, and it tells the Christian story, and it tells the struggle of Christianity. So you should be so excited, amen, to hear the gospel again. Hallelujah. Every day, the same thing happens. They wake up, and they get dressed, and they form themselves in battle array, as though they are prepared to fight, and every day for 40 days, the same thing happens again and again. What happens? Goliath, a Nephilim giant, stands up, and I'm just imagining this now in my mind because the Bible doesn't say it explicitly. Stands up, and he goes to the edge of his side of the valley, and he says, send someone to fight against me. You know, when the first time I read this story after the Lord had gotten a hold of my heart, the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, that is my church. They all dressed up on Sunday and they hooting and hollering and they over here doing this worship dance. But the reality of it is, is this, is that Monday through Saturday, they're living in defeat. The enemy is breathing threats of slaughter on their life and he's paralyzing them with fear because they don't know how to walk and to trust in the power of my Good. might. Every day, the same thing's happening. Send someone to fight me, you cowards, and the men stay frozen in the camp. Now listen, can you imagine for 40 days the same thing is happening? They wake up every day, they dress themselves up, and if you read part of it, it almost acts like you're thinking that there's really going to be a fight, that they even went down into the valley. But no, nope, as soon as it looks like they're going to fight, same thing happens. Goliath stands up and says the same thing, 40 days. And then comes a long young day. He's not a king yet. He's just a little shepherd boy. He's spending time in a field with a harp in his hand and a song in his heart. And he learns his God. You know, there's something so powerful about spending time in the presence of the Lord. If you've never done it, you ought to really try it. 
You know, that's one of the things I don't preach enough anymore. Because, listen, when you take the message of Calvary, the finished work of Christ, and the grace that you receive from that, and you have the understanding and revelation that you not have free entree into the presence of God, and then you actually act upon that, yeah. and you begin to uh, get yourself alone with the God of glory, hallelujah, yeah. and you maybe put some worship music on, and you start, even as a man, come on somebody, even as a man, you start standing up and you start telling Jesus, Jesus, how much you love him, and even maybe let a, te a tear trickle down your cheek every now and then, and get broken in the presence of the Lord. Now listen, the prophet also said this, he said, don't rend your garment, rend your heart. Yep. I'm tired of seeing an outward display of a bunch of religion, rend your heart, give your heart to me, learn how to worship me, get into my presence. That's the life. See my presence, feel my presence, experience me. Yes. I paid a high price so you could. I'm telling you right now, if you will start spending presence in the presence, spending time in the presence of God, and you begin to ask the Holy Spirit, I know that He will do this for you. You begin to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are the one who Jesus said will take of what it is and show it unto us. Holy Spirit, I need your revelation. Teach me your word, great teacher. Help me to understand your ways. Holy Spirit, I want to be closer to you. I want to know you. I want to be led by you. Teach me Jesus. Let me see him more clearly yeah. today than I did yesterday. And use me on this fallen earth. Dare you do such a thing? <laughs> Let me tell you something. You try to do that. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be so tired. You're going to be so sluggish, man. You just reach over there and hit that snooze button one more time. Don't let the devil lie to you. Amen. Sometimes you just got to push through. And then yeah. when you realize that, you know what? You start praying for grace to get up. I didn't mean to preach on personal time and worship in the presence of the Lord. But listen to me. I remember one time, I don't know, it was probably in somebody's book that I don't even like that much. So I'm not going to tell you whose book it was. <laughs> but boy, it's a good idea that... Peter was running after he had denied Jesus because he smelt a, a, a smell of the fragrance. It's like, that's the Lord. And he took off running. That This is all fiction. Took off running to cut around that corner. And he ran headlong into Mary, who had anointed the feet of Jesus, who had broken that alabaster box and had anointed the feet of Jesus for his burial. And I remember preaching that message one time where I thought to myself, there was only two people that smelled like that ointment in the room. Everybody smelled it. Everybody in that room could smell the, the fragrance of that ointment as it wafted in the air, but only two people smelled like it. It was Jesus and it was her because she was all over him with that stuff. And in this fictional story, Peter got a smell of that around that corner. And what he did was, no, he ran straight long into her is who he ran into. Because you know what? Sometimes whenever people have truly been in the presence of the Lord, you know it. Because they still got the fragrance of Hallelujah. Jesus on them. Hallelujah. And that, that we, that's what we need to do. We need to come to that place where we would seek the face of the Lord. Amen. But we're talking right now. We're talking about young David. He's in the field. He's got a harp in his hand and a song in his heart. But here they've been, they've been there for so long in this same scenario, day after day after day after day, but he's been in the fields with God. He got a different perspective, man. <laughs> he ain't like the rest of the church. He ain't seeing it like the rest of the church. He's got a different perspective. He knows God from a different angle than what they do. They've been living two different forms of Christianity. Young David's been living a different form of Christianity than what they are, if you will permit me to say it that way. You know, one of the things I was, concepts, but I know I don't have enough time to really build on this, but the army of Israel, is kind of like a New Testament thought, is going really kind of the way of Judas or Peter, where this denial and this condemnation is the ultimate plan for the enemy is to destroy them, right? He destroyed Judas and all that. He, he wanted to destroy Peter. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked permission to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed that your faith fail not. That's what the armies of the Philistines want to do to Israel. They want to destroy them. The army of the forces of evil, that's what they want to do to you and me and our individual lives. They want to destroy us. But David, if I was going to give him a New Testament scripture, he's Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Nay, and 
all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's, it's like a decisive victory that goes beyond what anybody else expected. Can you imagine that? To gain a decisive victory. You know, he's, he's, he's singing. He's singing in that field, but don't think that he's not fighting. You remember that story where he was out there in that field and a lion came and with the power of God's might, he killed that lion and then a bear came and with the power of God's might, he killed that bear. You see, God's preparing him. Amen, that's right. God's preparing him to be able to fight. I'm, we're going to be here for a little bit longer. Y'all going to have to bear with me. <laughs> that was point number one. Point number two is this. Is there not a cause? You know, the child of God is one that is different than the world. It makes sense that maybe the Ammonites would fear Goliath, but not Israel. You know what I'm saying? This is the church. This is the church, and yet they cower, and then his brother gets mad when he offers to fight. Do you remember that? This guy is still already, this guy's still licking his wounds from the previous chapter whenever he was the oldest and the tallest and the best looking, and he thought he was going to be anointed king, and they had to call David. You know, I can't whistle, but they whistled to him, I guess, and they brought him in from the field, and he ends up being the one that they anointed. He's still licking his wounds from that. And when he sees David, he says, basically, he's like, you insolent little brat. I put it in my own words. Yeah, I know the motives of your heart. You want to make us look bad. Who do you think you are, you little punk? We've been doing this for years, and you're going to show up and tell us how to do it? You're a fool. You need to go home. And young David said, is there not a cause? Amen. Don't we have a God that gives his people victory? Isn't he the God that split the Red Sea for our fathers? Isn't he the God that gave the man in the wilderness? Isn't he the God that made the walls of Jericho fall down? David read his Bible and he knew the God that he served. Is there not a cause to trust him? Hasn't he gone before us in battle before and saved the day? <laughs> oh, yes, he has. He gave me the strength to kill the bear and the lion, and this uncircumcised Philistine will also die today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. This uncircumcised, look, there's so much theology in just that one statement, this uncircumcised Philistine. What David's saying is he's not even in covenant with our God. We're in covenant with the God of glory. That's point number three. Is there not a covenant? That's something that David knew. This giant may be big, but I'm in covenant with my God. He's not bigger than my God. Might be a Cosmo Crater, but he's not the Crater. He's not the one that spoke this world into existence. Amen. They must, they must have met in the Valley of Elah. That's the only thing I can see. <clears throat> I can imagine young David bouncing down. You ever seen them mountain goats, how they climb up on them mountains, man, and they're just so agile? I can see young David. Like, the, 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 the army's sitting there watching him, and they're like, what is this fool doing? <laughs> Goes down there just like, just like nimble, coordinated, athletic. Walks down there just taking his time. It's like, man, this ain't my first rodeo. Pitt sees them the right stones as he's walking. He just keeps on moving. Everybody's just watching like, what in the world is going on? Look at the confidence of this kid. He picks out those stones with one stone and the sword of Goliath. His own sword. That big head rolled that day. You know, I can see, listen, the Bible says that David took that head with him to Jerusalem when it was all said and done. But you think for one second, man, what a warrior. I mean, like, I mean, we don't know how old he is, but I mean, I'm just thinking, you think he doesn't have some troops riled up now? I mean, just like, boom, 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 pop, knocked him down, cut the head off, and just picked it up, that big old head, picked it up and showed it to them. And you think them men didn't go crazy on that day? Can you imagine the cheers going on? And I mean, the screaming, oh, man, hallelujah. The Red Sea after all. That's right. Oh man, what a powerful scene. Listen, I want to share with you a New Testament scripture that expresses this very thought. It wasn't just for young David that day, it's for you today also. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. 
He says, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You are out of covenant with God. This is a New Testament thought now. Has he quickened together? What did it mean? You were dead and now he's given you life. That's old King James English, quickened. Remember that movie, The Quicken the Dead? Quickened, it means life. He gave you life together with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. What is that talking about? The law. That was against us. Did you know the law was against you? Why? Because you broke it. Why? Because you can't keep it. Why? Because you, it, your flesh is corrupted by sin and you're weak in your own strength. And if you're trying in your own power, you cannot keep God's law, at least not the way God expects it to be kept. Because he expects it to be kept every jot and every tittle. And when you miss it in one spot, you failed it in all, according to James. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. The law was calling us guilty because we were. But he took it out of the way. How did he do that? He took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Oh, look, I need you to put the next verse up there. I forgot that was the most important part. And having spoiled principalities and powers, same things that we've been talking about in the book of Ephesians whenever we were covering that. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. This is the first time I've ever connected, connected Colossians 2.15 that I know of to the story of David. But listen to me. This is a spiritual New Testament thought. In the Greek language, the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, Kenneth Weiss describes this. He's a Baptist scholar in the Greek language. Describes this as the terminology was used during this time. So what the Apostle Paul, the image he's trying, he's, he is depicting, or the Holy Spirit is depicting through him, is that when the the Roman Empire would destroy their enemies. What they would do is they would take the leadership of the foreign military and they would they would remove him of all of his signs of power and then they would bring that army back to the city of Rome and all the citizens of Rome would be on the on the on the rooftops and they would parade their vanquished leaders from that military before as the Roman the Roman centurions and whatever the case on their stallions parading through town I can imagine I'm just saying I'm kind of adding some Hollywood to it dancing horses and here these guys are being probably drugged by chains their naked body all scrawled up scratched up and 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 what but what he's trying to do is he's using this physical image to describe what happened in the spiritual realm when Jesus hallelujah fulfilled the law and died on the cross and just and triumphed over the principalities and powers what I'm here to tell you is that in the spiritual realm when Jesus look there it goes again this this word it right there is antecedent. What is an antecedent? You got to connect it back to the previous noun. What was the previous noun? The cross. How did Jesus, this, and that's what I'm telling you, the message of the cross is all over the place. That's how Jesus defeated and made a show of them openly because he destroyed their power when he paid the penalty that's for right. sin. That's right. Amen. Listen to me. The work is done. Hallelujah. I submit to you, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, and this goes for the preacher too. If we got a problem walking in victory, it's not God's problem, it's not his words problem. You know who the problem is? It's us, and it's our flesh, and it's our refusal to surrender and to keep faith in the proper object and to surrender to the will of God and the plan of God. And if we would surrender to the will of God, it might not happen when you want it to happen. God's not on our time schedule. Man, this whole journey is about a test of your faith. That's right. Amen. That was, I'm pretty sure that was Leonard Ravenhill that said it, that this whole thing is a dress rehearsal for eternity. <laughs> now, that will bring you some perspective in your life. I'm just trying to say, like, you know, whenever you go, we get all caught up in our material possessions, this whole thing is a dress rehearsal for eternity. Amen. All right, moving on to point number four. This is, this is where we're ending with point number four. And I said, was there not a victory? Yeah, was there not a cause? Was there not a covenant? Was there not a victory? The reason I put this last point in here, and some of you have been with the church for so long. I mean, one day y'all might say, okay, okay, Pastor Matt, it's kind of time. <laughs> we got to replace you because you like to say the same thing. 
Most of y'all probably don't really remember everything in fine detail. Some of you maybe do, but just bear with me. I just love some of this stuff. Was there not a victory? See, there's a story. I bring this point up because maybe you, you might be here and maybe the enemy would try to make you feel bad because there have been some victories in your life, like the lion and the bear for David, but then when Goliath showed up, it didn't quite go the same way. You know what I'm getting at? It didn't quite go the same way. I mean, you, you might have failed in that particular situation and you didn't see victory, but instead you failed. And the enemy has a good way of heaping condemnation and making you feel like you're never going to win. Making you feel like, you know, like, it, like it's useless. He has a good way of doing that. I have to tell you that God has his own way to blow a little Holy Ghost wind on your dying embers. You know what I'm saying? If, if sometimes you feel like that's what one of the scriptures in the New Testament in the book of Matthew it talks about a smoking flax he will not quench that's what it's talking about you just got a little bit of fire left Jesus isn't going to stamp it out no he's going to blow on it he's going to blow on it he's going to get it stirred up that's what the Lord wants to do a, 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 a bent reed he will not break see that's not how the Lord is the, the truth of the matter is is that even sometimes the preacher might do it the wrong way and you might be going through the worst time in your life and I might say a word that hurts you instead of helps you. It's not like I would do it on purpose. <laughs> but the reality of it is is that I'm a mint. Jesus will never do that. That's right, he will amen. never break a broken, a, a bending Lord. reed. He will never snuff out a smoking flax. Jesus will blow on dying embers and he will cause a fire to come back. See, there was a time in David's life when the victory of Goliath was in his past. He was anointed king, but Saul wasn't letting go and wanted David dead. This is the time when you're waiting on your promise and Satan, Satan is drying up everything around you and you're heading in the wrong direction fast and you need to be reminded of the power of his might. Sometimes there's some times in your life and in your walk with the Lord that you need to be reminded about the power of his might. David shows up by himself in a particular place called Nob and he doesn't even have a weapon with him. I mean, he's on the run, man. Saul wants him. Saul Saul's wants, wants his blood. And you can put 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 9 and 10 up there. I'm, I'm talking to somebody this morning that maybe you've seen some victories in your life before, but you've been experiencing some struggles as of late, and you're kind of just uncertain and you're questioning does even all this message of the cross stuff work? I'm here to tell you that the gospel works. Hallelujah. That God works. That the plan works. It says the priest said, David says, is there not a weapon here? I need a weapon, man. Look what, look what the priest says. The priest said the sword of Goliath, the Philistine is here. <laughs> whom you slew in the valley of Elah. Behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will, take that. Take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. What other weapon could there be that I would want at a time like this? There is none like that. I need to be reminded of Goliath and what God did on that day when he showed up. Because right now I've got some stuff going on in my life. Well, I need the Lord, hallelujah, to remind me that I need to learn how to walk in the power of His might. Now, the Bible doesn't really say anything much more about that, but I remember I studied it out before, and there were several miles from Nob to where his next destination was. And he was going to the wrong place. He was about to go make himself cozy with one of his enemies and act all, you know, and, and, and engage in some stuff he ought not have been doing. But I'm here to tell you right now, I believe with all of my heart. I don't know whether it glistened. I don't know whether he left, kept it wrapped up in that cloth. But I'm imagining that that sword was bigger than his horse. Or pretty close to it. It was hard not to notice that he was riding companion with that sword is the point that I'm trying to make. And as he's over there riding like a cowboy in the desert, that sword's wherever it is, strapped to that horse. And he's over there looking at that thing. And he's remembering and being reminded of the victory that the Lord had given him. If you're sitting in here this morning, I would imagine that there's been a time in your life. Amen. Where there's been some victories in your life. 
Yvette, could you come and just maybe get prepared to sing a, sing a song, you know, uh, get your guitar out and just be led by the Lord? Uh, you know, I'm not going to belabor a point because I have preached long this morning, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive some prayer if you want some prayer this morning. Amen? Maybe you're going through something this morning. Maybe you've experienced some chaos and you need the Lord to breathe fresh on your fire. If not, we'll just worship the Lord together and ask Him to breathe fresh on all of our fires. Amen? Amen. So he's sitting there riding and he's seeing that horse and he's being reminded of the victory that the Lord gave him. That's one of the things, if you'll remember in that story, whenever Goliath came at him and he's like looking at him like, I am not even, I mean, I just want to get the picture. Goliath's looking at him like, I'm not even believing. What are you doing? And, and you know what David said to him? You come at me with spear and sword, but I come with you, come at you in the name of the Lord. Ha! Victory is secure because I'm not the one fighting today. The Lord is in this battle. Amen? Amen. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 20. The Apostle Paul told this to the church of Rome. He said, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You might be going through some things, but listen, I just wrote you a whole book on how the message of the cross works. When you put your faith in it, how the old man died, he was buried and a new man has been resurrected. And even though you might go through some trials where you put your faith in some law and frustrate the grace of God in your life, I'm here to tell you that if you will keep on trusting that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, hallelujah, and that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He just wrote him all that stuff. And he said, you just hold on to the Lord and hold on to this gospel message that the Holy Spirit had me send to you. And shortly, the God of peace will bruise Satan under your feet. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. It's our faith. It's our faith in the right thing. Our faith in God and His plan. Hallelujah. His age-old plan that He will not change. How many times have I said that? God ain't changing His That's plan right. for none of these modern-day preachers. He ain't going to do it. No, nope. there's been one plan and He's going to stick to it because it's His plan and it works. Yes. Galatians 6.14 But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You got some problems? The world's trying to creep on your back. The world's trying to whisper in your ear. Trying to draw you back. Let me tell you. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's death to the old man. Resurrection life to the new man. Hallelujah. That's how Jesus gives us the victory.